Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the second uh, lecture um, on uh, the basic principles and challenges of uh, inflation. I just wanted to make one uh, footnote, uh, which is uh, that we have two types of um, sweatshirts at the ITC. Um, and uh, if we believe that the speaker is not giving necessarily a very good presentation, we give that speaker the Princeton sweatshirt. <laughs> Uh, but if we are proud of the speaker, we give the speaker the Harvard sweatshirt. And as you can tell, Anna is wearing the Harvard sweatshirt. So. Okay, thank you, Avi. Uh, though I'm also proud of being now in Princeton, so I actually like both places a lot. Okay, but um, let's get um, back to lecture and inflation. Um, I just want to make a short summary of what we um, did on Tuesday. As um, we have seen, I introduced inflation as a solution, a simple solution for the initial conditions problem of the standard Big Bang Theory, namely the flatness problem and the horizon problem. And uh, we also found that inflation in addition was able to give an explanation, a dynamical explanation for the density perturbations, that they are nearly scale invariant and dominate on scales below 100 megaparsec. So what we have seen is that inflation can be in a model independent way defined as a phase where the equation of state parameter that characterizes the ratio between pressure and um, energy density of this smoothing fluid that dominates uh, this phase should be below one. This solves the um, flatness problem as you recall. And in order to solve the horizon problem, this phase should lo last long enough um, so that the universe, the size of the universe is stretched um, sufficiently, uh, in a sufficient, to a sufficiently big size. Um, so that everything has already been in causal connection that now appears to be homogeneous and uniform. And what we have seen at, uh, that means that the total number of efforts shouldn't be less than 60. About 60. And we also know in order for structure to form, um, this inflationary phase needs to end, and the inflationary phase ends when the criterion number one breaks down. That means that the equation of state parameter is uh, not any more smaller, but equal or bigger than one. Okay, what we have seen also that just by making these very simple assumptions, we can derive a whole set of predictions, which are, as we will see um, in a few seconds, quite impressively confirmed by um, observations. So. The first one was partial flatness. This was the reason why, partly why inflation was introduced. The second one was that we also have seen that from the measured amplitude of the density perturbations, we can immediately derive the mass scale or the energy scale of inflation. This is really important to know because there is a bigger confusion about the fact R gives the scale of the energy scale of inflation. We need R measurements. This is not true. Just by d over rho being uh, 10 to the minus 5, we, can, we know that the energy scale of inflation is around 10 to 15 GeV. The third uh, um, feature was that was already an initial conditions problem, but inflation was not introduced to solve this problem, but could solve this problem. So this was, I think, the first real evidence or confirmation in favor of this theory was that inflation, in fact, produces a red tilt and nearly scale invariant spectrum of density fluctuations. And the fifth um, prediction of inflation was that the run of the scalar spectral tilt is negligible. So it's really of order 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 4 and is negative. And the sixth, seventh, and uh, eighth uh, predictions, so I listed now eight different predictions, um, were about the tensor perturbations. We have seen that the simplest, the most generic inflationary model predicts a significant gravitational wave spectrum. We have seen that it should be of order 25 or 30 percent. We have also seen that it always needs to be a red tilt because otherwise the null energy condition would be violated such that the equation of state needs to be negative in order to have a blue tilt. This uh, um, contradicts inflation. And as an eighth prediction, we have derived a consistency relation that independently can be a confirmation of um, the simple inflationary theory. Now, what we know today or we feel comfortable about when we see um, or when we look at the current observational data 
are the first five predictions. We are pretty confident about the fact, as we measure from the temperature measurement of the cosmic microwave background, that uh, in fact the first five predictions are real characteristics of our universe. Now, regarding the points 6, 7, and 8, I think it's fair to say that we don't yet know about 7 and 8. And 6 is in motion, right? And I don't need to take, tell more about this, uh, this place. Um, BICEP2 reported the first measurement of cosmic, uh, cosmological gravitational waves, but we also know that we will be really confident about this result not because we don't respect this result, but because this result is so extremely important when Planck or other experiments will independently confirm it. But this is great, this is an exciting time because this is new and important. And if measured really at that high amplitude that we didn't respect anymore, then it seems to be, and this was I think part of the reason for this big hype around this uh, um, announcement, it seems to be uh, um, exactly the same value that you would have expected, but you somewhat already forgot about after uh, um, the microwave, um, the latest microwave background constraints, that it's a significant R. It's not an R of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 3, it's a 20, 25% R. Okay, so this is something, keep in mind, we will get back to this. Uh, this is something that is not yet confirmed, and the first five predictions speak for uh, the inflationary model because they are observationally confirmed. Now, there is, of course, one more thing that we have a bit forgotten about during the last weeks, but it is not less important than the R measurement. Since there is one more prediction that is not yet completely settled, we are getting very close due to the amazing Planck results, um, and the next release will, I think, shed even more light on the non-Gaussianity uh, um, features or non, no non Gaussian features of our universe, it is the non Gaussianity. So, what is non Gaussianity? I didn't mention this because it takes some time to explain this, and I didn't want to uh, crash this together last time. Usually, it's a complicated calculation. Usually, it requires field theory, a lot of uh, you need to develop uh, uh, um, some tools, but we won't do that here. But what I will um, tell you is a story without calculations, but I hope that you will understand what non-Gaussianity means and why inflation uh, naturally predicts a small amount of it. So this is just an independent and very important test of inflationary models. So let me begin by uh, reminding you that we discussed the inflation works with two kinds of physics. First, the background evolution is governed by general relativity as a purely classical evolution. But this is not enough. We superimpose on the classical evolution quantum physics and we don't treat the field just as a classical field, but we know that the field undergoes um, quantum, is also underlying, on underlies the laws of quantum physics, therefore, um, and this is the good news, because therefore we have this quantum or quantized perturbations in the classical metric that leads to the density and tensor perturbations. So instead of having here just a field sitting at an exact, exactly uh, or well-defined um, space, on the top of the potential, we have a field distribution due to quantum physics. Now, just by assuming this, we derived all the predictions for the density perturbations or tensor perturbations. However, this is a simplistic view. In fact, um, here, by this assumption, we assume that we can synchronize all patches, uh, um, all Hubble side patches, such that they all behave in the same way. But since quantum physics uh, um, is um, here, or is acting within this scene, we cannot assume that we can synchronize everything in the same way, right? So quantum physics, each time when you want to make everything extremely precise, it says, no, that won't work. And therefore, um, by each effort, so by each expansion, uh, each time unit or each Hubble um, time unit of expansion, there is a new mode or new patch created. And this is slightly, this is slightly, uh, um, the fluctuation is slightly differently than the 
original patch was, or the, the patches are inflating or fluctuating that were created earlier. So we, due to quantum physics, we cannot assume that the field um, or these different Hubble size patches are synchronized, are completely in the same, completely sync. We need to um, account for the fact that they are not. And what does this mean? So if we look at this field that, um, or if, if we look at the evolution that we know that there is a classical evolution and in addition to the classical evolution, so the displacement in the classical field value, and this is, has a negative sign, we'll get back to this uh, somewhat later in the talk, so really memorize this, uh, um, this formula or this expression. So in addition to the classical displacement of the field that is moving down here towards the end of inflation, it's always uh, towards uh, the, the, to uh, the bottom of the hill. There is uh, the amplitude of the quantum fluctuations that can go into both directions. So how the, hill, uh, how the field is moving is decided um, by the ratio of the classical displacement of the classical motion of the field governed by the classical um, field equation and the quantum law that gives you this dispersion. We have derived this it should be of, of order h that should, this this delta phi squared um, or square root of delta phi squared should um, scale as h but we know that this doesn't scale exactly as h as I just explained Patch by patch, it can decide to be of h, it can decide to go plus h, can decide to go minus h, so it can have the, have the field go more downhill, faster downhill, or it can prevent the field going as fast downhill as it wanted to go, and it can push the field uphill. Of course, it is not a simple random walk, it can be of order plus minus h, but some uh, um, some patches will push up the hill by, for example, plus 10h. Some will push down the hill uh, even faster, minus 5h. What's important is that the slight differences due to the random walk of the field that differs patch by patch, patch by patch, the tail of this distribution is different. Okay? So this is really important. Um, it's a generic feature of inflation, and this is the feature of inflation that leads us to the perturbations, density, and tensor that we like. And as we will see later, that will lead us also to the facts that we don't like. Therefore, it's a really important feature. Um, so it's the motion of the field, or this field distribution, is the result of the competition between either positive or negative between the quantum fluctuations and the classical field evolution. A very important point, really, that's why I'm emphasizing it. Um, now, what does it have to do with Gaussianity, non-Gaussianity? Usually, the first assumption is, if this random walk is really random and the potential is completely flat, then, interestingly enough, we can assume that the field, uh, that the dispersion or the random walk is happening according to a Gaussian distribution. What does it mean? It means that the step size varies according to the Gaussian distribution. So the step size, what I uh, illustrated by being 1h plus minus 1h or plus 5h patch by patch differently. Okay? So, however, this really would require a completely fat potential. So we have a completely Gaussian random walk. And what's important to know, we know that cannot be true because then inflation never ends. And we also know we don't want it to be true because then we wouldn't have a spectra tilt that is not totally scale invariant. We know we have a small deviation from scale invariance. And therefore, we also know that this potential is not completely flat. Even more, we also know that our tilt as we derived at leading order is proportional to the equation of state. So what we would expect is that the non-Gaussianity in the simplest inflationary models is proportional to the, uh, to the equation of state parameter. Now you could, and earlier in fact it was assumed that it's about epsilon squared, but Maldesena has shown in 2000 that it's exactly, 
it scales exactly for the simplest inflationary models that we have been discussing so far as the equation of state parameter. And what does it mean? We know that epsilon is smaller than one during the inflation. That means you would expect no significant non-gaussianity from inflation. And this is really important. And this is important for two different reasons. First, you should be suspicious if people produce models for theoretical reasons with large non-Gaussianity. But you should also be suspicious from the experimental point of view, because since the impressive Planck uh, uh, constraints, new constraints on non-Gaussianity, we know that it still can be significant in terms of 5, 6, or minus 5 or 6. But plan constraints from really orders of magnitude 10, 20, 30, down to this small value. So it pushes us towards the simple models in the sense that um, the best fit with Planck allows for some amount of non-Gaussianity, but it's a big constraint on non-Gaussianity. A lot of inflationary, more baroque inflationary models that predicted significant non-Gaussianity are not anymore in game. So this is good news for the simplest models. And this is also something you need to be watching out for. So um, parallel to the R measurements, this is also something that is very important how it will turn out for inflation. If it will really go into the same direction, that it will be smaller, 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 um, then it's good news. But if they report three, four, or five, around five, then you can start to be suspicious because it will, be, it will push then away, us away from the simple inflationary models. But in, as it stands now, it's uh, showing towards the simple models. And just to uh, complete this analysis, because you quite often see something like FNL, sometimes with this superscript local. So there are different parameters, different kinds of non-Gaussianity. This would lead really too far here. This is, uh, I don't give now non-Gaussian lecture. The most important uh, thing is just to know, this is a second order effect. So the first order effect was already of order 10 to the minus 5. You know, this is the first order linear perturbations. And now the non-Gaussian, this is really what I want to emphasize. This is an extremely tiny effect. It's a second order effect. So it's an effect of order 10 to the minus 10. So you see this is second order in curvature perturbations. Zeta, if you recall, that is uh, corresponding to the d over rho. So density perturbations, as we discussed on Tuesday. So it's a small effect. And the more impressive is that we are also able to measure it. So. Um, this is everything now what I want to say about non-Gaussianity. Um, because it's rather technical. This is the story um, behind it. What I want you to recall again and again uh, for today is this random walk nature of the inflationary field. Very important. And we'll get back to this. But now, um, even though I'm a theorist, I think observations are very important. And therefore, I want to give you a very brief review of observations. I think it's more than appropriate to say that there are, in this audience, a lot more people who could do it much better than me when it comes to observations. Therefore, what I want to show here is only what kind of plots are most interesting for theorists when we want to connect our predictions to, to observations. So it won't be a complete description of observations. I will simply tell you what kind of measurements are interesting, results are interesting, where you should look when you are interested in the predictions when you want to check back. So the special curvature is notably, um, can be notably seen in the first acoustic, acoustic peak, in the microwave background. So what you see here, I'm pretty sure that almost all of you is familiar uh, with this plot, is the temperature and isotropy or the temperature fluctuations uh, as a function of the multiple moment. And the multiple moments corresponds to the uh, angular distance. All L is uh, the connections L is about pi over uh, theta, which is um, which denotes the angle from which is measured of the separation by which the, the uh, um, different hotspots and schools but are separated. What's more important is the first angular or this L is also source as something else. This says in the far left side. Um, you need to look in the far left and the far right side are very important regions. Why? Um, because 
the scales here are corresponding to scales that were, that this scale is um, size of today's horizon, and these scales are uh, even bigger scales, but these scales are the smaller scales. And the first acoustic peak in the microwave background measures exactly the size of the horizon at recombination. And why the flatness can be derived from here or can be seen here? The reason is because if you, you know the equations, people who measure these curves can predict if the universe is curved, then I want to get back to the physical size of the universe, then I is packed here of different kind of peak. So what is important, the first acoustic peak would be, say, uh, for an open universe, higher than for a flat universe. And if you plot now the curve for how it should be, first acoustic peak for the flat universe, then the impressive thing is it really agrees with observations. So what's important for here is look at this curve, plot the different uh, uh, um, curves that you would expect for different kinds of curvature. And if the special curvature is flat, then you should see in this plot exactly this curve. And in fact, that's what you see. So it's an older result, but it's still extremely impressive because as you hear quite often this story, people for rather long time believe that the universe is not flat. And even though inflation was already around, so it's a historical note, inflation wasn't always favored. Now it's, we, we are really used to the fact that this is the main theory, and I must uh, um, also admit that I'm probably still too young to remember times when it was not favored. I don't remember that. I only know this as a, theory, as a standard theory. But I know that flatness was a point of inflation uh, that was generic to inflation, but people uh, debated for quite a long time. So the measured flatness was something that was important for inflationary theories. This was an important indication for inflation. Okay. So flatness. Second, the density fluctuations. So this is really a long story, and I really just want to show you the plot that you quite often see when it comes to theories talking about different models of inflation. This is the NSR plot, and this is in uh, one way misleading and one way very helpful. You can only focus first, only focus on this NSR plot if you know what are the other measured characteristics of the density perturbations. Namely, this plot is, tells on, use only something if you can already neglect the run, okay? Because by non-negligible run, you cannot assume constant NS, therefore you need to include a third axis into this plot and re-evaluate the models where they are sitting if there is a run. So assume in order to look this plot, the, non, the run is, non, is negligible, therefore NS is constant, is non-varying, and you can assume for the inflationary model approximately the same NS. Second, it's very important that you can also assume that F and L is negligible. According to uh, um, the simplest inflationary models, namely the single field models, because otherwise it's also not telling you anything uh, except that a lot of models, not only this one field models, but a lot of models generating non-Gaussianity can be included into this plot as well. So you would again uh, need at least a third axis that plots you F and L and places the different models in a 3D plot. So what we see is, and this, is, this was very, very justified after Planck, what we see here is um, the ranking of inflationary models that all predict negligible run as measured or as suggested by Planck and that all are characterized by non Gaussianity that is uh, negligible or of order the equation of state parameters smaller than one. And if you assume that, then you can really focus on the models that predict, uh, um, that predict the same thing um, with respect to FNL and the run. And then you can ask, okay, then really what really distinguishes models are really just the NS and R values. Because an inflation model is um, characterized by more parameters. But the models that predict the same values, just put this run, FNL, and so on, that can be distinguished by this plot. And what you saw after Planck, I also don't say more about this, what you saw after Planck 
it is just very interesting that models were mostly favored and also advocated by leading theorists of inflation that predicted small run. And by small, I mean really of order 1% or smaller. This is will be important. This is on the one hand important because today we believe that's not right, or we have reason to believe that's not right. But second, we also want to know why later. Why is, why is it good for inflation if it's small? Is it good for inflation? Why can we celebrate inflation when it's small? And why can we be not happy? But I think for that there is a good reason why I can be happy if it's big, because that's generic. But keep in mind, after Planck, the favored models were so-called plateau-like models that we saw, that um, have this, this new inflation-like models that uh, um, predicted NS around 0 0.96, 0 0.97, but small run, around 1% or below. And this is what you, sorry? Um, the tensor, yes, sorry, I said run, I'm sorry. I said tensor to scalar ratio R, R, I'm sorry. I was misplaining, a negligible run, I'm sorry, thank you. Okay, so this is really important. What I also want to mention, because we are in the center of astrophysics, that um, while most characteristics of the density perturbations is extracted really, in fact, from cosmic microwave background measurement, non-Gaussianity can also be seen in large-scale structure um, measurement. This uh, relates to the fact that the galaxy formation is reflecting um, the curvature, the distribution of the curvature. That means large non-Gaussianity would enhance the uh, uh, um, structure formation. So these are, this is a very interesting thing So because these are then um, venues that are interesting for astrophysics. So by astrophysical uh, uh, measurement, you can test primordial cosmology. This is probably nothing new to most of you, but I think it's worth mentioning. So density fluctuations, and now we come to tensor perturbation. And this is only for completeness because um, it's a hot topic. Um, the first measurements came out about a month ago, or I think today exactly a month ago. This is April 17th, and exactly a month ago. And the community is very excited now because these are extremely important results. And what we do is now are excited and wait for independent confirmation so that we can really be sure about this result. And as I don't even need to mention, the next, probably the next uh, confirmation will come from Planck. And there are other measurements running um, the two Princeton lab experiment. ACT, ACT, and SPIDER, um, SPT from Chicago, and then Polar Bear. I think there are also then other proposals, I'm sure, because if there is a, a, a measurable R that will, as, as was just emphasized, and this um, being emphasized all the time, this open up, opens up a really new window to the early universe cosmology, therefore, it's just exciting, and I also don't want to tell more about this, because um, I think I'm not the most experienced person to those experiments. It is just important, it's important, <laughs> and we will get back to this, why it's important later. Now, what I owe you still is, before we get to the problems, because up until now it was just um, kind of celebration of inflation, I want to show you how actually model building goes. Because what you see, especially now in the literature, uh, models. Each day at least two, three, four papers are presenting you new inflationary models. Now the question is, should you be impressed or can you eventually go home after my lecture today and construct a new inflationary model? I would say everybody in this audience could do that, but I wouldn't recommend. I think you shouldn't write the paper that you can write after one hour. Many people do this, but I don't think that we learn anything from this. We just learn that we know how to build complicated inflation models that can accommodate any kind of measurements. But in order um, that you understand why it's so simple to build inflationary models, I want to tell you a bit more about the picture that I have neglected so far. And this is the field picture. Recall, so far I only mentioned the field picture when it came to the perturbations. Now, the field picture is, of course, not just needed or not just an appropriate description when you use the quantum perturbations, 
um, or perturbations of quantum nature. The field picture also describes properly the classical evolutions. It is just nicer and simpler and more model independent if you use the hydro picture because as you know we didn't make any assumptions about is it one field that governs inflation? Are these ten fields? How do the fields behave to one another? We just assume there is some background evolution that is well represented by a perfect fluid with a certain equation of state. Now if you go and ask, okay, what can be on the microscopic level this fluid, then today our assumption is it's a field. We call it inflaton, but many people say, oh, not just one field. This could be a lot of fields. And then the story becomes complicated. Now in the moment I will stay with one, simple field for the very reason that the observations push us towards um, small or negligible FNL and models with multiple fields that are not extremely contrived, extremely fine-tuned, usually predict non-negligible FNL because of the interactions between the fields. Okay? So this is enough for you that you know that as soon as you have a lot of fields, they would naturally interact with one another, therefore predict non-negligible non-Gaussianity if you don't tune the theory. Okay? This is important and therefore because observations uh, tell us well, this is not the direction you need to go now, therefore I will focus here on the one field picture. Again, we see the potential that we see quite often and I don't have here now the quantum distributions because I want to show you that um, indeed the background also can be described by the field. So what we described uh, up until now by the equation of state that can be equally well described by two field equations and the first equation is not new. This is just the field description of the first Friedman equation. You remember, we described h squared is just the square of the Hubble parameter. This represents our total energy. And in the hydro description, it was just the, ener the, the inflaton field um, energy because that dominates. That this, this field dominates, as you remember, that was a rule um, sub s over a to the 2 epsilon. And that's why we introduced epsilon b to be smaller than 1, because that suppressed curvature and anything else. And therefore, we could assume that here the inflaton um, or the smoothing fluid energy uh, dominated the right hand side of the Friedman first Friedman equation, or in other words, the total energy density. Now, we don't do here anything else, we just say this total energy density in field theory is represented by the potential energy. So when we talk about slow rock conditions, and then we just say the kinetic energy of this field is much, much smaller than the potential energy. And in the inflationary phase, because the, the field is rolling down slowly, therefore the name, the kinetic energy can be neglected. Okay, so this is really important to you know. I'm not talking about something as it is just an equivalent description of the same thing. Now, starting from the microscopic description. And the second um, point is, what we could neglect so far is not, not any more negligible because we made an assumption what drives the microscopic uh, evolution. This is a field and therefore we need a field equation. So we have not only H now and assume that epsilon is just constant. We have now two uh, independent, if you wish, fields. One is the scale factor that is represented by H, but the other one is the field. So to have two uh, evolutions we need, or to express two evolutions, different kinds of evolutions, we need two equations. And the second equation is just the field equation. And this is also important. It's not a exact equation of the field. There should be a phi double dot, so the acceleration of the field. But the second slow rock condition is that the acceleration of the inflaton field is so much slow, um, smaller that it's negligible. The term that would say here phi double dot plus 3h phi dot and phi dot here is again just the velocity of the field with respect to physical time by v prime is the first derivative of the potential with respect to the field. That will be again my notation in the following that prime is derivative with respect to the field by phi dot is again a derivative with respect to physical time, then the field is simply governed by the simple equation and you can neglect, this is the second zero condition, the um, acceleration compared to this 3h phi dot term. So, 
this is important because this is just um, what defines you. If you start with the field picture, these conditions uh, define you, the inflationary phase. As soon as these conditions break down, so the field velocity becomes comparable or bigger than the potential, or the acceleration cannot be neglected anymore, then your inflationary phase breaks down. This corresponds to the equation of state parameter not being any more uh, smaller than one. Okay? Just two, two equivalent pictures. I think it's very neat. However, also, remember this because that will be important. Inflation itself doesn't explain why you can assume these rural conditions. We say inflation, we are in an inflationary phase when these conditions, these rural conditions are fulfilled. And what does it mean that inflation itself require, requires initial conditions, namely the fulfillment of the rural conditions? This is important. Just as we couldn't explain why we could assume that epsilon was smaller than one, we needed to assert it. If that's given, then everything is working fine. But we don't know why it's the case. Is it a problem? Well, we will see. For now, it's just important to know inflation itself requires initial conditions. And these are the slow raw conditions. If you don't assume slow raw, you don't have inflation, and you have no justification for the spectrum of the density perturbations. This will come also back, just uh, record this later too. Now, this is not something I want to spend too much time on, just for your notes so you see how it works. Um, we started with epsilon n, and um, we can um, introduce a second hydrodynamic parameter as the change in log epsilon over uh, the number of efforts. I just put it here so you see, first of all, that everything can be directly translated into the field picture, um, just by definition of W that we have already discussed last time, and just by definition of N as it was introduced Tuesday. What's more important is that you quite often hear slow raw conditions and, it is different, slow raw parameters. The slow raw parameters are, in the hydrodynamic language, epsilon evaluated at the 60th e-fold, and this eta evaluated at the 60th e-fold. However, the solar conditions, because we have here the direct relations, correspond also to features of the potential and the derivatives of the potential. Namely, uh, when we say um, inflation is when epsilon is smaller than 1, this corresponds to, and to a flat potential. This corresponds to the requirements that epsilon and eta during the inflationary phase are smaller than 1. And this is important, that's why you see this requires flat potentials because the first and second derivatives are smaller and we usually require that are much smaller than one. That means that the potential is really flat. Okay? So this is how it connects to the um, field and hydro picture. And what is more Im even more impressive, you can express any and all observables in inflation in terms of these parameters. And I just want to go through bef before we get to the problems or why it's not the end of the story that I um, finish with this example and then we all go home. Um, I want to give you an example. The really simplest inflationary model is the lambda phi fourth potential. It has a simple parameter and this parameter is dimensionless. Okay, and m square phi square has also just one parameter for comparison, but m is dimension full. And the dimensionless parameter is really the least thing that you can have. It's very neat from the theoretical point of view. Now what do you usually, you can first of all calculate that the solar conditions V prime over V and V double prime over V are all fulfilled uh, smaller than one for the inflationary phase and independent of lambda because this is first or second derivative lambda just cancels out. And you can also see, we have already discussed this last time, that um, the initial condition, um, the field initial, where the field is initially and a value field ends alone determines the number of e forward. So you need absolutely no tuning. Lambda just cancels out in order to have sufficient amount of inflation. It's really important. Even more, if you calculate the number of inflation, then you see it's about 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 10th. So the total number of inflation is enormous and without any tuning. So this is very neat, okay? And when you hear sometimes that inflation generically is tuning in order to have 60 for that's not true. It's only when you contrive your models, when you have 
more complicated model, then it becomes, in fact, more difficult. But for the simplest models, you don't need any tuning. So generically, inflation gives you a lot more than 60 foot. So it naturally solves the horizon problem. However, and this is where we can start with the problems, there is no inflationary model. And I think this should be a bit disappointing because this is one feature that we usually celebrate. There is no inflationary model that would naturally predict the over being 10 to the minus 5. From the very beginning, um, you needed to plug this number into the theory. Now, and in fact, for a number of years after inflation was introduced, this was the only problem people were really interested in. If we can make, a good, make up a good argument for this number, and what is this number? This is this lambda. So that's why you need lambda in the theory. I just cited here um, relations that we have derived last time and uh, substituting for the free for the last side. We can, in fact, express the, scale, uh, the amplitude of the density perturbations in terms, again, of the potential and the first derivative. And you see here lambda doesn't cancel out. There is a lambda square remaining. And because I know that it needs to be, from here I can, of course, compute phi at the, six, the field value at the 60th effort uh, by using this relation um, and setting for phi, and for example, 0 or whatever, where it even ends. Then I see that I get a value for lambda. And now this is disappointing, and this lambda is, as you see, 10 to the minus 18. If you wish, it's not as bad as the cosmological constant problem. It's not 120 of order of magnitude, but 18 orders of magnitude being different from 1 is probably not something a theorist should be happy about. Because this is tuning. This is, um, I just was in Dallas in a conference in December in the big relativity conference. Steve Weinberg said, what? It's not one, so I don't like it. So I think as a theorist, um, you should be at least somewhat bothered about this. But I don't think this is the biggest problem of inflation. What you should just know is this is really requires tuning. Now what is nice still, and why people weren't really bothered about this, and I would say if this were the only issue in inflation, I wouldn't really be bothered about this, because by way of using the single parameter, you can express all the other uh, um, observables of inflation, you can express an S. Um, this, by the way, these are just the same values. You could check it if you recalculate it as it, they were for the 1 over n uh, equation of state parameter. You can express them and you will see that these are just the predictions of um, the model that we discussed last time. So, simplest model with one parameter, you get seven or eight predictions. That's okay. So, um, if I think this wouldn't be the biggest problem because we know, for example, from the standard model uh, that we work on theories that require tuning, but we don't trash them. Okay. But now it comes to the um, more difficult story. Because I told you so far, you, uh, I told you a story that was great. Inflation was introduced as a theory of solving initial conditions problem of Big Bang and gave us, in fact, a lot more. And predictions of this are quite impressively confirmed by observations, even more so lately. So, and I'm standing here and we'll finish my two talks on inflation by telling you a lot of problems. Well, that's how it is. Um, I think that, unfortunately, none of the problems are just as impressive as the predictions as long as we could treat them as predictions. So the first um, thing is, and this is really not something I would consider as the most worrisome. The simplest models require uh, some amount of tuning. We shouldn't be happy about this, but really, again, I want to assert this one more. I don't think that you should trash a theory for these reasons. That otherwise is working very well. You just should keep in mind this would be something to work on because probably it would lead us to a more interesting theory, more explanation. I think there are a lot bigger problems. And then I start with a problem that you wouldn't expect from a theory that was introduced to solve the initial conditions problem. So recall that inflation, and this is why I emphasize this, needs its own initial conditions. And these initial conditions are the solar conditions. The picture is a field should be sitting on the top of the potential 
with negligible velocity and the energy density, total energy density dominated by the field energy density. And of course, negligible acceleration as well, because otherwise you are jumping down to far inflation ends and you don't produce enough efforts. Now, recall what we did with the Big Bang. We said, it's not bad if a theory requires initial conditions. We should just not be surprised when we, when we want to see how typical or if we would expect these initial conditions. And it's fair to do the same with inflation. Are the slow raw conditions typical? Should we expect them? Or do they call for an explanation as well so that inflation itself creates a new initial conditions problem of some kind? The um, argument that I will into, um, tell you now is from Gary Gibbons and Neil Turok, 2006. It's, however, the problem was pointed out first in a more abstract way uh, by Roger Penrose in 1986. So inflation introduced 1981, and the first, second bigger problem um, was pointed out just a few days later. I also want to emphasize it that this is now a problem that I've introduced you that all people, advocates and critics of inflation agree on. So no matter if you have, for example, from the founding fathers, Gut Linda or Steinhardt in mind, Steinhardt is, uh, um, drawing different conclusions from this problem, but all three agree, and you can check the latest papers um, on this, all three agree uh, in the point that I will present you is true, inflation doesn't solve the Big Bang initial conditions problem. In fact, and as I will show you, it introduces a more severe initial conditions problem. And why is it the case? Because if you ask this question, if it's likely or it's typical, it's of course a bit awkward to talk about likelihood and introducing probabilities uh, um, into cosmological or physics discussion, but it's inevitable because we did the same with the Big Bang initial conditions. So we cannot judge a theory in a fair way if we uh, don't ask if it really does the job as it, uh, for which it was introduced. So in fact, the first conclusion of Gibbons and Turok and is in general, so I will give you an argument, is that this because of the quantum nature, very unlikely to find the field at rest anywhere. We know this. But just getting back to classical, uh, um, to classical arguments, you can, by assuming and knowing that, this, that inflation doesn't produce any entropy, so this is a reversible um, um, process, you can just track back the evolution. You can ask what's happening if I start from the end of inflation and extrapolate back in time and start and ask what are the most likely conditions then? Um, and you don't need to, this, to know any more than what I introduced you in at the first place when we discussed the flatness problems that different energy components of the universe scale differently, okay? This is really important. We know, and this is just can be read off from the right-hand side of the Friedman equations, that the kinetic energy scales is one over eight to the sixth. The gradient energy or curvature, this is the gradient energy scales in the same way as curvature, scales like 1 over a square. You recall that was the dangerous guy in that equation. In an expanding universe, this is the guy that drops lowest, therefore it could dominate the energy density very, um, very fast. That was the flatness problem. That, was, that led us to the flatness problem. And the potential energy density is nearly constant, this scales as log. So if you extrapolate black in time, in an, in an expanding universe, so going forwards in time, A is growing. So the most dangerous term is the one that has the smallest exponent, because that drops lowest. However, if you extrapolate back in time, you shrink the universe, okay? And you are in a contracting phase. So in order to go back to, from the end to the beginning of inflation, assuming reversibility because new entropy is produced during inflation and after inflation, um, you can see well, what will very fast dominate the overall energy density is the kinetic energy. So instead of having naturally um, potential energy dominance, if you have at the end potential energy dominance, you would expect, it's a simplistic argument, can be also worked out with different kind of statistical mechanical arguments, as was done here. If you are interested in it, you would expect most natural kinetic energy dominance. This is not good news for inflation. Then instead of having slow rock conditions, you have a fast, fastly moving field. Right? Um, 
you never start inflation that way. So, what are the red banner here? I just want to summarize it. Um, it was very, very soon discovered that you cannot uh, work with arbitrary initial conditions. Then Linda introduced, um, as you know, the monomial potentials as being chaotic, as being the guys that can start at the Planck density if you assume um, equipartition all, of all energy forms. So potential energy is about the same amount as kinetic energy and as uh, curvature energy or gradient energy because compared to potential energy, all the other forms will drop so fast that you have within a Planck time immediately potential energy dominance. So if you can prepare these conditions, that was the argument of uh, Linda that he advocated also quite a long time for chaotic inflation and to which he now comes back, um, given the R measurements, um, is that assuming equipartition, you are in a good shape. But the argument that I have shown you that exactly assuming equipartition is not justified because naturally you should assume kinetic energy dominance. And in fact, um, the problem gets worse if you go to the potentials that, uh, that, start, that cannot start at the Planck density like monomial potentials, but are always dominated by uh, a plateau like that means have always small energy densities. Because while Linda could assume for his monomial potentials um, equipartition at the Planck energy density, if you have plateau potentials that are um, the models that were advocated, that were favored by Planck, and OSW map, given the Planck FNL value, so really after Planck first, then you know that those potential haven't started, the, the potential energy couldn't be the same size as any other energy forms because it was um, smaller than the Planck density. So they have, the plateau has about an energy then 10 to the 16 GeV to the fourth, Planck energy density is 10 to the 19 GeV to the fourth. That means you have three orders of magnitude to go. So instead of starting with a potential energy dominance, you need to go through a, usually what we assume is radiation energy dominance that is dominated basically by some different sort of energy, which is usually kinetic energy. And what makes it worse is not that the kinetic energy dominates because it drops as a 1 over a to the 6, but we have a guy there, and this is the gradient energy, that drops uh, like curvature as 1 over a to the square. That means before you could reach the potential energy, the gradient energy could grow. So the kinetic energy already drops, but the gradient energy could grow, and it could spoil immediately or pretty fast the homogeneity within the patch that is required for inflation to start. So what it means that here you need to prepare at the Planck density a much bigger homogeneous patch such that it accounts for this drop in energy density and the homogeneity is still not spoiled. So um, actually, um, I wrote a paper on this after Planck with Avi and Paul that it's also a calculation for this, but it's a very simple argument and what you need to know now this is already unlikely, <laughs> has been calculated a couple of times, but the problem is that if, you, if we need to go back to Planck, I now forgot about bicep for a bit because we don't know how the two, will, um, how the two experiments will uh, um, fit together if the tension goes away or um, I just take Planck now for face value and uh, see what happens then. If bicep comes to it, then we can go back to this situation, probably, runs going away or whatever. I don't want to speculate on this because I think this, this competition is open uh, um, in the sense. But this is still bad. So monomial potentials with big R say, oh, this is already difficult because we would expect kinetic energy dominance. But if we have plateau potentials, then even with these initial conditions, if you are ready to buy the chaotic initial conditions, you are also lost. This is not good. And this is what I have already mentioned. We should keep this in mind. Because after, and this is really something that is, is really recognized by pretty generally in the field, especially from uh, um, any kind of leaders in the field, no matter how, what their attitude is to inflation. Um, the problem is then people try to focus on the perturbations. 
However, the problem with this is that you still need to justify your initial conditions because without the very same initial conditions, you would get a totally different perturbation spectrum. So um, what I'm saying now is we are at a really difficult point now, is observational evidence for inflation, and I haven't yet talked about all the problems, but we have here problems, especially a big problem. What should we do with, with a theory that on the one hand fits observations, but on the other hand doesn't do the job for which it was introduced? Namely, it doesn't explain the Big Bang initial conditions, but, and it can be shown, simple calculation, it can be shown that just assuming flatness and homogeneity, so the original problem is already unlikely, this is still more likely to assume that to, to have our universe just by asserting them, uh, than assuming inflationary initial conditions and leading or getting through inflation to the Big Bang. And I think now this is really something that uh, you should, where it's difficult to know what to do. Def definitely we in some way need to fix this problem. But which direction? Let me get back to this. Just in, in a bit. Okay. I have two more problems to tell you. And I have for that about 10 minutes and I think I will manage that. So one was pointed out actually, I'm rather thankful for this, uh, um, by Alan Good himself. Here, in the very same room, a bit more than a month ago, he says, um, or he said, when Avi asked him, Isn't it, doesn't it bother you that inflation cannot be falsified, he said, and you can rewatch it, um, because this is also in the CFA, he said, well, this theory is too flexible to be falsified. What does it mean? Some people don't like the word falsification. <laughs> it's okay, we can replace it by saying uh, it's compatible with any experiment. It's compatible if John says I measure R.2, but it's also compatible when the Planck team says, well, R is below 1%. In fact, if you watched out for this, some people didn't go back to the chaotic model, some very prominent people, but were, um, were advocating potentials that at the same time, just by plugging in different values of parameters could give you 0 R or could give you 0.2 R. And I think this is disrespectful towards the great experiments. I, I think the experiment is much more important than not to take it seriously and say, for me, one fits, but if you, if you give me a, a value that is two orders of magnitude bigger, that's good too. So I want to tell you what's the reason for this. And I think this is also not the, it's a problem that probably could be solved if we are ready to restrict ourselves to simple models instead of going to baroque models. I just think we should really keep ourselves uh, to this rule by saying, no, I don't immunize my theory against observations. I'm ready to go with the simplest models in any case in the moment it looks anyway good for them, uh, with, at least with respect to the R value. But don't introduce 10 parameters and say, oh, that's also good if it changes. Because I'm not an experimenter, but I would be extremely upset if the theorists say, no matter what you do, my theory is right. So the reason for this is the following in inflation, the conditions um, for inflations are not constraining enough. You recall we have two constraints on inflation during the inflationary phase, and now I plotted the inflationary equation of state parameter as a log plot. It is just the same epsilon as a function of n, as we discussed it from the very beginning. It just said it should be smaller than one during the entire inflationary theory, and it should be at least 60 if we saw the simplest models. It's absolutely no problem to produce orders of magnitude bigger inflation. So no problems. However, inflation doesn't tell us what kind of functional form um, you need to be restricted to with respect to epsilon. So what does it mean? I showed you that there is a good argument for taking the simplest potential uh, just by heuristic argument, uh, simplest equation of state parameter that corresponds to lambda phi for simplest potential to monomial ones, potentials, and having a scale-free inflation from one over n equation of state parameter. But nothing, nothing forbids to create such a function as your inflation equation of state parameter. 
you can introduce 15 parameters and have a functional form for an epsilon as a function of n with 15 f degrees of freedom. You can do that. You can do 25, you can do 50. In fact, you don't need really 50 because you have probably five or six observables you need to account for ns. You, if you wish, you should count independently for r. You should, that's the second parameter. Then you should account for the run, third parameter. You should account for tensor tilt, fourth parameter. And then you could hope that you can fulfill the consistency relation because r and, uh, and t tensor tilt were plugged in independently. And fifth, you should also account for FNL. So by five parameter, give me a five degrees of freedom, I can fit any observations. And this is a problem. This is a problem for the reason not because we don't like simple model building. I could give you this as an assignment if I were your official lecturer. You would also do a great job with this. Just because um, we want to connect our um, theories to experiment in the way that an experiment can tell us you are wrong. I think this is how physics works. And if we always come back and say, oh, we just, we just trashed out the models we liked six months ago, and now come back with models we liked two years ago or 10 years ago, I think this is disrespectful towards the theory, and I think this is also dishonest. I was told that I'm young enough to be honest, so I'm trying to be. So I think this is a problem. But again, just as fine tuning, I think this is not a problem for which I would trash a theory in a way if I restrict myself, for example, by introducing a principle like scale freeness, I can make a theory predictive. So I think initial conditions problem is something you need to recall. And I want to close with something that is, I think, a real problem. Now, you hear quite often this is the best thing about inflation. Um, I don't belong to those people who tell this. I want to point out a very impressive um, fact this is a very generic inflation, uh, feature of inflation that I will be talking about in the next five to seven minutes. But this is the first feature that was after, of course, the fine tuning of D rho over rho, uh, or that D rho over rho requires fine tuning, was pointed out just one or two years after inflation and density perturbations were introduced. First by Steinhardt, he was within the same paper where they calculated the Nuffield workshop density perturbations. He wrote a paper, Natural Inflation, and what I will be showing you. Um, he has shown that new inflation, that was then the workable model of inflation, and Linda came with the chaotic model one or two years later. Um, and also, of course, I should also mention, Linda independently introduced uh, the same model as Steinhardt introduced. But he pointed out that this model, this model that was known as the by then workable model, or only first workable model of inflation produces eternal inflation, and Vilenkin, later Linda, and then later Guth have shown, but Alex Vilenkin was the first who has shown, this is not only generic for the new inflationary models, what's coming now. This is generic for all inflationary models that are so neat to give you the density perturbations. And now we get back to the random walk feature of inflation and what we like about inflation. So this will be a problem. I have no idea how to fix, and I also know that I'm not in a small group because the very same good Linda and also the other side, say Steinhardt or Turok, are the same opinion, it's a complete agreement, nobody knows yet how to solve this problem. So after 31 years, there, were, there was a lot of effort being done and we cannot fix the problem. Now after I told you this is an open problem, I think I should tell you now what the real problem is. Um, okay, so before I show you the video, I mentioned two um, things. Record the random walk. What does the potential do? This is a competition between the classical evolution of the field going downhill. You remember the field evolution is governed by this field equation, uh, which is the 3 uh, h phi dot is minus v prime. This is a simple equation that means what is important in the classical evolution of field is going downhill towards the end of inflation very slowly, because otherwise you don't get enough inflation. Now, however, you cannot say, cannot tell the quantum physics into which direction to go, and therefore, quantum physics may, as I explained, uh, this may or may not have the field go down here. So, in some cases, and one case is where we ended up, uh, uh, um, this is our universe, in some cases, 
and in the most typical cases first, we can assume that the distribution is such that in most cases the quantum evolution will have the classical evolution. So the quantum evolution will push the field also uh, downwards, or if it pushes it a bit uphill, it just helps creating the different kind of density perturbation spectrum. Okay? It just delays it such a bit that you get a real spectrum of density perturbations, you don't end up with a completely homogeneous universe. That was the good news. Now, but we also know that there are regions, as I showed you, and the distribution of these regions is approximately a Gaussian random walk. There are regions where um, the quantum evolution, and I will show you in two or three slides, uh, the computation is very simple, where the quantum evolution, the dispersion, is bigger than the classical evolution. That means that it really pushes the hill upwards, and it prevents it coming down for a significant amount of time, for many Hubble times. And for many Hubble times means that if the field gets stuck, the classical field cannot come down because the quantum field pushes it upwards, the classical evolution doesn't stop, the universe is expanding. So the quantum evolution keeps the field inflating, while the uh, keeps the field on the hill inflating, and the inflating regions go because the background classical evolution also continues. So what does it, what's happening? Because of this uphill movement due to the uh, quantum dispersion, some regions, these ends of the tail of the distribution, remain uphill and continue to inflate. And that means that the quantum decay of the field cannot keep up with the expansion, so that inflation never stops entirely. It stops only on some scales, but not on the larger scales. It's, it stops on scales um, where we are, where inflation ends, where the field manages down here, the parts of the field distribution that manages down here, and the inflation, and create a bubble universe. But there are remaining parts of the field that remain up here, inflate, and the really tragic uh, um, feature of this thing is that those regions grow exponentially fast. Why? Because inflation is an exponentially fast expansion. So, and I will show you the video uh, of this, how you need to imagine that. What's happening is that the regions that you thought are the most typical regions, they stop inflating, create a homogeneous patch, but the less typical regions continue to inflate. And because the expansion, inflation is exponentially expansion, grows, creates more, more and more volume, this atypical regions takes over in volume. Some of them, of course, they create, again, such a dispersion to the more typical region of the atypical region stop inflating, goes down the hill, but still, quantum evolution uh, doesn't allow everything to stop. There is an uphill uh, motion within dispersion, and that means that the atypical part of the atypical part continues to inflate. Now, that takes over uh, in, on volume, uh, um, compared to the atypical region that already took over volume compared to the uh, typical region. And what happens is really the problem. And now you can think of is it physically real or is it a conceptual flow? I think for both reasons there, uh, for both uh, options there are reasons. But this is a generic feature of inflation. And look how it looks, what happens to inflation. So you start inflating, this is a typical region, end it up. And what this peak represents, it uh, repeats it again, himself, itself again and again. Uh, this is the ratio of the volume. So the, the um, thicker a peak, the more volume it occupies, and the thinner it is, the less volume it occupies. You see the most typical regions become the thinnest. That means the most typical region on super, on super light scales, not on the scales that we are familiar with, but on the scales of the, if you wish, eternal inflation multiverse, the most typical regions that we would want to be are the least typical one. If you end up be, uh, inflating within a finite time. Now, what turns out, because it continues infinitely, everything repeats itself infinitely often, therefore the most typical regions are there infinitely often, but the least typical regions are there also infinitely often. Yes? Oh! This is just um, if you, this is just the potential uh, upside down. So if you and I integrated out volume. So I actually took this from this paper uh, from Linda Linda and Mezlomian, 
And this is just the same picture as I showed you. Without the volume, the field rolling down the hill ending inflation. And then uh, if I integrate out volume, then I can represent the thickness of the, or the, uh, um, by the thickness of the, of the peak, I represent the ratio of its volume. If I do it, it if I normalize it by some finite size. So it's really just the ratio of some, of the originally inflating region compared to, this is the dispersion of the wave function, compared to the tails of the wave function that then become thicker. Um, so here, this was the first distribution that becomes thinner because, because the tails of the wave function continue to inflate, but also partly end inflation. So this is the same story I was telling you. But then again, here, here are the ends of the tails of the distribution you can follow one peak. This is the most typical one. And you see, by it becomes thinner just means that the last typical region continued inflating. But what I want to show you, I can actually compute this. First of all, what I want to show you is this. Because it's fair to say this. Um, I think two year long, it was fair to call these guys predictions. And this also will be, again, fair to call them predictions if you can fix the multiverse problem in a way that the same predictions remain. But after the multiverse problem was discovered, then unless you can solve the problem, it's problematic to call those predictions. Why? Again, I get back to Alan Guth. Because in the multiverse, anything can happen. And as Alan says, it will happen. And the problem is that will, everything will happen that can happen an infinite number of times. So what it means, I don't know what should, to expect in the multiverse. Because any combination of curvature, F and L, run, T and R, can be there in the multiverse. And there is no theory, and especially not with an inflation. Inflation itself just tells you, expect everything, and I cannot tell you where you are. If you are lucky, and this is how... Some people come back, we are lucky because we are humans or whatever. I don't want to discuss that argument, at least not before the questions. Um, then, because everything will happen, you will be somewhere there. But in most regions, you won't be there. And I think now, unless the multiverse problem is solved, such that we can get back to the old predictions, we must say that this, predict this theory doesn't have any predictions. And therefore, Unless you stick with old inflation, with the old 1981, 2, and 3 inflation, and say, I believe and I can show you a solution as a theorist for the multiverse problem in a way that I preserve the solutions, you cannot honestly, you can be dishonest, but honestly you cannot say this is a prediction of the theory because you don't exactly know because of the multiverse. And this was, I think, also somewhat consistent when the first reaction of some leading people to R was, well, this confirms the multiverse. But zero R would also confirm the multiverse. So I think I want to close with this question. Um, because this is something that should bother theorists, especially our universe cosmologists. Uh, I want to show you how easy it is to compute why it's a generic feature of inflation. This is a computation that is, can be found in this very early paper from 83. So we just need to compare the when, what are the conditions such that the field dispersion overrides the classical evolution. So the downhill motion, as I explained, overrides uh, or is uh, overridden by the uphill motion. And we typically compute this for a unit Hubble time. Um, this is just from the, so within a unit Hubble time, just take the field velocity. So times time velocity is just, uh, you can see, uh, the movement, downhill movement in the field. And we also have seen that the um, dispersion is of, or the um, mean square of the fluctuation is of order h, square root of it. And if the second, if the latter one is bigger than the first one, if the quantum evolution is bigger than the first one, then you know you are in trouble because you continue to inflate. And that means you can derive this condition from comparing H to, the, to this guy. And we know it from Tuesday and also today that it's exactly the amplitude of quantum density fluctuations 
we also have seen today, this can be expressed as a feature of the potential. And when this should be bigger than this, then the whole expression should be bigger than one. And what does it mean? You just need a sufficiently flat potential. Okay? This can be shown because it corresponds to V prime over V is smaller than one. This is very generic. So you can show this for new inflationary models. Linda has shown it already, I think, 84 or 3. I um, don't want to say something bad with years. Anyway, he has shown it for chaotic models. Vilenkin has generalized it anyway. Um, and you hear it quite often enough, so there is a reason why everybody says this. this the reason is that d over rho is on large, for large field values naturally bigger than 1, and the potential is flat. So we don't know of any non-contrived solution. You can make an extremely contrived solution where your first, you have two stages of inflation. First stage is extremely steep, so you don't have a flat enough potential. You block the multiverse, and then afterwards you inflate very fast. However, you know it requires many parameters. So if you wanted to solve the initial conditions problem, you were already troubled that the guys who produce the multiverse require some unnatural initial conditions. Now, um, you want to make it worse by contriving and saying, oh, I find you even those initial conditions. Well, then I think it's really fair to ask, okay, for what am I doing this now? What, what is the problem I want to solve? So I think this is a very general opinion. We don't know of this. Now you can be happy about it. I don't see the reason for it, but uh, um, I think multiverse is in any way troublesome. And I want to... Um, Close now. We saw the problems. We saw, I want to, on the first three things. First, we saw the simple original inflationary models are extremely impressive and in very good agreement with experiments. Now, we are extremely lucky because today we live in a time where experimental results are just coming out after 30 years. And this puts, um, I think, especially theorists under somewhat more pressure because, on the one hand, we don't know if, any, if, if this R measurement is confirmed. This is, that's why it's so important, why everybody is so uh, interested in it. We don't know of any alternative that would um, produce R, uh, that significant R, as was uh, um, claimed by John and his team. Then you would naturally, so it throws out all the alternatives, all the known alternatives, if that R is staying. So you would naturally say, okay, but that, that speaks for inflation. On the other hand, you must be troubled by the facts of the multiverse, that the multiverse would predict, give you a zero R, that it makes undoes your theory, that the theory itself doesn't solve the flatness and horizons problem, therefore cannot even justify its own R anymore. So um, I think what we need to do is watch out for the expert as theorist is to work on this. And I think there are two legitimate ways. One way is, even though there has been a lot of work done, in the last 30 years, try to fix the multiverse problem that you can get back to the original problems. I think it's a hard, hard job, but I, I think it's not impossible because nothing is impossible. On the other hand, you can try to think about alternatives. But now, with the constraint, with the new constraint, if it's really uh, um, the constraint we need to focus on now, that you need to figure something that produces such significant R as it has been, as it's, it's, if, it's there, uh, if it's measured, or as it's measured. Uh, um, and I think this is a big challenge. And then there is a fourth problem, of course. You need to connect everything to the rest of physics. Because inflation stays there in a way that it's connected by reheating to, in a phenomenological way, to physics. I'm sorry I'm running out of time, but I close in a minute. Uh, but it's also not connected to quantum gravity. So I think for theorists it's an extremely exciting time, also because of the great experiment, but there's a lot to do, and I would think it's the biggest mistake to say that early universe cosmology is already done. Then thank you. Thank you, Anna, for an excellent talk. Uh, for those people that were taking notes, um, Anna planted one typo, so you, your challenge is to find it. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> Or maybe uh, uh, h squared is for the v, not v squared. Oh, OK. That, that was just a type. Um, any questions? We have a few minutes. Yes. So you made the case that uh, 
inflation could, is not provable because it can predict anything. So tell us about the ekpyrotic model um, and what these new results have to okay. limit it to. Yeah, so the short uh, version I've already told you, I think the only competitive alternative um, to inflation, but unfinished, incomplete alternative, because there is a theory missing of the bonds. So this is a theory, first of all, that says before the bank there was a slow contraction phase that smoothed the universe and created as a curvature perturbation. And there is a bounce, the theory of the bounce is missing. And during this bounce, this curvature perturbation is by bending of the trajectory, are converted into density perturbations. So the theory could predict the same density perturbation spectrum as inflation. But there was a, so that was very early on worked out for the currently known models by Steinhardt and his student Leighton Boyle, that those models cannot predict um, measurable R. So they predict at first order, they predict R that is about 10 to the minus 7. And at second order, so from the curvature, the isocurvature perturbations would induce second order curvature perturbations that would be around 10 to the minus 6. It's basically, their statement has been always very consistently, if you measure R, measure R. It's so important to measure R. Those models are out. So this is, that's why it's so, so important. And that's why so many people are getting back to focusing on these big problems. Because this measurement is important because that says, no, you cannot, you cannot uh, uh, compete with those models as we know it today. Uh, um, because they generically don't produce R. So for, for any, is there a range of R, for example? That 10 to minus 6, 10, 10 to 7. 10 to minus 6. So I, I'm not an experimentalist, but it's basically unmeasurable. John was up to that a couple more years. But <laughs> the other point that should be mentioned is um, we're talking on scales bigger than the horizon. So any causal effects, like for example, if you have cosmic strings, they would produce gravitational waves, but they would usually have uh, suppression outside the horizon because it's causal physics. And so it's not easy to produce gravitation waves on very large scales. How about well, there is just one point I want to add. So I think one appealing feature of those models was, and that's why um, I think it was it's very useful to look at them. They don't produce the multiverse. So what you are that's why people um, I think who like them, but it's not so rewarding in this community, unfortunately, to like alternatives in the moment. Um, I think this is a very, very good feature. So now you are at a point where you know this is predictive. I think it's a great feature of the model. It is predictive. So as soon as you measure R, you know you are done. This is physics. And I think, but on the other hand, you saw a mechanism that could produce density perturbations without producing the multiverse. Because there you have a low energy potential. You don't have this runaway behavior. So this, I'm just saying, I think if you are a theorist thinking, you need to. Um, manage that uh, uh, something which is described prob probably at an effective theory level as inflation does, does the same so that it doesn't produce multiverse. I don't know how it goes. I don't think that anybody knows in the moment how it goes. But um, I think it's fair to say probably if, if this is as it is now, and I also want to mention if the consistency relations are then confirmed, if there is no blue tilt, for example, for the tensors, we are really far away from that. We are not yet done with all the lists that is for inflation. Then um, we really need to make some decisions as theorists. And I think the first thing is how to, how to create some inflation like something. For example, it appears like inflation at the effective theory level that gets rid of this multiverse. That, but this is a personal opinion. One thing to keep in mind is um, in the context of quantum gravity theories, we also have a problem with black holes. There is the information paradox of the entanglement. It seems like something is screwed up in the context of horizons, quantum mechanics, uh, the combination of the two. And that's good for young people. I mean, there is something to explore. Daniel. I was going to go, go at, that same, at that same point. That, I, mean, I, don't, I don't study quantum gravity at all. I don't know what I mean, mm -hmm. you talk, obviously, have to be brief. Uh, yeah. But it seems to me that that the, at least at this, mm -hmm. the way that the multiverse was presented mm -hmm. here, it really is making a particular assumption yes. about how to mesh quantum mechanics onto classical mm -hmm. mechanics. And effectively, you're treating mm -hmm. the field perturbation mm -hmm. as a stochastic, time-dependent force on, you know, in the classical mm -hmm. field. 
And I'm just not so convinced that quantum mechanics has mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, whereas it, it feels to me that's different from how the, mm -hmm. the density perturbations come about. In the density perturbation case, I could say, look, I'm going to have some potential. At my initial time, I'm going to freeze in some quantum fluctuations which are spatially dependent. And then everything rolls downhill and I get different amounts of inflation in different spots. I don't have to, I don't have to invoke a time-dependent forcing. I only have to invoke a single uh, spatially dependent fluctuation at the, at the early time. Um, so it isn't obvious to me that the, that the scale, that, that the scale, that the uh, spatial variations, the density fluctuations are necessarily tickling the same aspect of the quantum fluctuations that the multiverse catastrophe tickles. I, and it, I mean, I, I suspect nobody has the answer to this because it really comes down yeah. to how on earth do we quantize, do we, do we have a, how on earth do we evolve a quantum gravity theory and turn it back into the classical limit? But I just, I just worry that, we, that the answer could be in there and we haven't found it. Right, but, but the, yeah. May I, just, just one comment and I give it back to you. So I think um, in a moment we don't know how it goes. It is just, I see that one point as you pointed out, we need to have a mechanism that preserves the good thing about them. Somehow distinguish the, the bad fluctuations from the good one that gives us the density perturbations. And of course, if we modify something about quantum mechanics, we, we don't know how to preserve them. So I think nobody knows it in which direction it will go. I I, but the multiverse argument basically comes from the idea that as the, as the classical field is running downhill, yes. that there's some quantum stochastic forcing which is always causing some parts of it to jump back up. But without hill. that, you don't have the density perturbations. No, I, no, that's where I disagree. I think the density perturbations you can get by having by setting up different initial conditions in different spots and having them all run downhill. Oh yeah, but then you, then you are extremely... Con uh, yes, the multiverse can be blocked, as I said, by totally fine-tuning your initial conditions. Well, the question is, is, is the quantum mechanics yeah. and quantum gravity something that is completely stochastic in both space and time, or is it something that only needs to be quantum, that is only stochastic in, in, space. in three in three okay. dimensions? Right okay, I, I don't know the I answer, but nobody knows the answer, so it's, it's interesting. The argument too. that yeah. often is often made is that the semi-classical approach is justified because we're talking about weak coupling. We're talking about yeah. scales that are much less than the Planck scale. And we know that because the density fluctuations are small, and, and also the value of R indicates that the energy scale is well below Planck scale. You can't avoid that. So the argument is when you deal with low energies, you can do semi-classical calculations. Now, that's also true for the Hawking radiation calculation, and we have problems there. So the, my, my gut feeling is indeed something is, is wrong in the way we think about it. But, but that's why the experiments are important. It's, it's, be, it's because the multiverse is unphysical. Intrinsically, so this is a, this is the solution to it. I'm not it's not yet worked out. It's not a solution. There is a problem waiting yeah, for solution. Yeah. Okay. I think the good news is really there is a big problem to be solved. Yeah. It's good news for young people. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's uh, thank Anna again for an excellent.